uh, popping. We'll see if we can get that working and then and loud enough. <laughs> the joys of being in the sound booth. Anyways, uh, God has just blessed us with some great pastors that are part of our church uh, this morning. Pastor Ray and Joanne are help filling in in paradise uh, because of sickness. Uh, Mike and Steph are away this morning doing ministry. Uh, sometimes Rusty is out doing ministry and in churches. And then and, and Bob, he's going to be heading back to the Philippines here soon and be doing ministry in churches. And, and, and so it's, it's awesome that people that God has placed in our church, and not just them, but us as a whole, and using all of the ministries and the, the work that God does and through us. And, and so I, I'm just so grateful to be a part of Chico First Assembly and what God is doing and how God is working. And so um, I'm excited. So let's pray over our word this morning, and then let's get into this. So Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, uh, for this opportunity this morning, Lord God, to, to look at your word and see how it, uh, what you're speaking to us through it, Lord God. So Holy Spirit, uh, illuminate your word for us this morning. Speak into our hearts and lives, God, and we just thank you and praise you that we can be here together to honor you and to worship you as a group of people, brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord God, and you, God the Father. And we thank you and praise you for that in this, this morning. Amen. So, you know, we all probably remember Snoopy, right? The lovable beagle from the Peanuts cartoons. Well, one time Snoopy broke his left leg. And Snoopy was thinking about all of this, and he was thinking about all that's happened to him because of his broken leg. He's laying on top of his doghouse like he normally does a lot, and, and he's thinking. I'm going to show you here. We're going to put this up here. Whoops, went flying right by it. <laughs> there we go. And so this is what he says. I'll read it to you. He says, my body blames my foot for not being able to go places. My foot says it was my head's fault. And my head blames my eyes. My eyes say my feet are clumsy. And my right foot says not to blame him for what my left foot did. And as you can see in that last one, Snoopy looks out at everybody and he confesses. And he says, I don't say anything because I don't want to get involved. And that's kind of what we are sometimes as the church, right? The body. But when we think about the body, what do you think about and how do you feel about your own body? And I know that's a weird question, especially to ask here on a Sunday morning. But how, what do you feel about your own body? Because most of us probably wouldn't, would rather not think about our own bodies. And if we do, we probably don't think very nice things about our own bodies. We say, we say things like, it's too skinny, it's too fat, it's too short, it's too tall, it's too bumpy, lumpy, or just plain ugly. Kind of like the guy who was so ugly that when he was a kid, his parents took him everywhere they went because they did not want to kiss him goodbye. I know, rough, right? But at least that's what we think about our own bodies. And so it's kind of strange that, that Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians here, and we're going to read this passage in just a moment in 1 Corinthians 12, but he says down at verse 27, he says, now all of you, all of us together, are Christ's body, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of the body. I mean, what a statement, right? To say that as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we all are a part of what God wants to do, and we're working together as one, just like a body works together as one. We're all different parts, but we move together. You follower of Jesus, you, Christian, are a part of the body of Christ. So let's read our section today. We're going to start in verse 12 of chapter 12. I'm going to read down through verse 27. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. And it says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. 
And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. Which which are more presentable parts do not require. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And so if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. All right. So that's our passage this morning. And we're talking about this church in Corinth because this is where this letter was written to. And you could probably guess if you've been with us through parts of this or all of this series, what I'm going to say about this church, right? Because this church was a mess. They were doing things wrong and they were just, it was just a big giant mess. But as we see in this letter, Paul did not give up on the church in Corinth. In fact, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote two letters to them, at least two that we have in the Bible, right? And I counted up the pages of 1 and 2 Corinthians in my Bible. That's 21 pages. 21 pages were written to this church in Corinth that was a mess. There were a few other churches that received at least two letters, right? And so one of them was Thessalonica. And those two letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, have a total of five pages for them. 21, Corinth, five for Thessalonica. Then you go to 1st and 2nd Timothy, written to Timothy. He's got seven pages. 1st and 2nd Peter, his letters, seven pages. And then you have three, right? 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, that's only six pages. And this church needed 21 pages here. In other words, Paul went to very great lengths to bring change to this church here. He hadn't given up on Corinth, and you know what's even more important is that God hadn't given up on the church in Corinth, the people there. They still had their spiritual gifts. And if I, I don't know, I'm thinking about it, if I was God and and seeing the mess that this church was, um, I think Corinth, if I was God, I would have given them something like a bad Christmas, right? Like the, the kid's been a brat, so like let's take all the presents, load them up in the car, slam the trunk shut, and be done with it, right? You don't get anything. You've been too bad this year. But God is in the business of mending broken things. So why didn't Paul and why didn't God give up on this church in Corinth? It's because the church had the potential to change. God wasn't finished with them. God was working in them. And we're about to get into the spiritual gifts that Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians. We're going to start that next week. We're going to look at some of the other ones throughout uh, the rest of, of the New Testament. But before we get into these gifts that are from the Holy Spirit, we need to take a few moments here and talk about the Holy Spirit in general. Who is the Holy Spirit? Because These gifts that the Holy Spirit gives are gifts, but really the main gift that we receive is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit living within us as followers of Jesus. There was a lot of confusion in the church at Corinth. They were confused over a whole bunch of different things about the gospel, and this led to confusion about who Jesus really is, which led to confusion about who the Holy Spirit is, and I think it can get easy a lot of times for people to get confused about the Holy Spirit. I think it's also easy for us to get confused about the Trinity as, a, as well. And so God has shown himself in the scriptures as being God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and then we have God the Holy Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. They are three, but 
we are told they are one. Three, but one. Now, do we really understand that completely? Not really, no. All right? We really don't. And it just, it, it's hard for that to make sense to us, that sense to us because there's three, but there are one, they are one. And it's even harder, I think, to try to really completely explain what the Trinity is. But the Trinity begins to make more sense to us when we begin to talk about the church and what the church is. See, if God has, and God has existed forever in community, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, they've existed forever in community, that really says something about the local church. And what this says is, is that the church isn't just a place to go to, but the church is a family to belong to. We are part of the family of God, and we work together, we love each other, uh, we encourage each other, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. The church isn't just a place, though, also that we just show up to. And we come maybe once a week or twice a week or whatever that may be, but it's a place where we actually participate. The church is a place where we use the gifts that God has given us to serve and to help and to love each other. And so when the church is doing things the way that they're supposed to be doing things, it actually builds community. We work together. It's a place where we find encouragement. Do you know what our world really needs right now? It's encouragement. I mean, over these last two plus years or two years, whatever it is that we've gone through with all the things that have been happening, people are discouraged. People are without hope. And when the church is moving and working the way that God intended it for it to be, it's a place of encouragement. It's a place of hope. And when the church is doing things like that, it builds community. The church is a place of community, and as a community, we'll also, it will challenge us to being a part of community because there are things in each of our lives that need to be dealt with. We've got some rough edges on each of our lives that, that are there. Like things be, need to be smoothed out and so that we can become the people that God wants us to be. We also in church community find healing. God has designed the local church to be a place where we can find healing. This is really the way that God designed the church, but there are times when, when, when we go outside of God's plan for us as the church and as his people, and what happens is, is that brings hurts to other people. And that's why it's so important for us to be the church that God intended for us to be. And to see the church is God's plan A for the world. And when it's been you and we're following God and, and we're looking to Christ as the head of our church and we're lead, following his lead as the Holy Spirit directs, things are good. It brings encouragement. It brings strength. It brings hope. We, we share the gospel and the good news of what Jesus has done for us. But when we get off that, it can bring hurts. And so when we begin to be a part of the church as, as a community, I really believe it, it, it makes it easier for us to understand this, this idea of the Trinity. God is one, but there are three. And so when we begin to look at the three individuals of the Trinity, it, it really challenges us. And we've heard a lot about God the Father. We know things about God the Father. I think maybe probably we know even more about God the Son, Jesus. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, sometimes we don't have a clear understanding of who the Holy Spirit is. In some churches, the Holy Spirit just gets ignored all completely. And then there are some churches that all they talk about is the Holy Spirit, and they try to elevate the Holy Spirit above God the Father and God the Son. And the problem is that you can go to extremes when dealing with the Holy Spirit, but what we want to have is a correct, balanced view of the Holy Spirit. And so we want the Bible to guide us to show us who the Holy Spirit really is. See, when Jesus was talking about his death and his resurrection to his disciples, he told them that he would be leaving them. The disciples, upon hearing this, they really didn't like that. They didn't want Jesus to leave. Like, you can't leave us. They, they'd spent these years with him. They wanted him to be there. And, and so they'd been around Jesus for all this time, and, and he'd been teaching them. They really didn't want him to leave. And I think that that, that we can understand that, can't we? 
We would, if being around Jesus, we wouldn't want him to leave. Wouldn't our lives be so much easier if Jesus was actually living with us as the disciples had? I mean, it'd be really convenient for our, our lives as followers of Jesus, as Christians, like, hey, Jesus, what should I do in this situation? Like, this is what's going on. What should I do? And he'd be right there to give you, like, the best possible answer on how to deal with that situation. I mean, wouldn't that be amazing? But Jesus tells them that this isn't the best thing for us. In fact, in John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And so it's for our good that Jesus, after his death and his resurrection, that he ascended back to heaven. It is for our good. And the reason is, is because Jesus, if he, you know, if he, when he left, he sent the Holy Spirit to us. So when Jesus was in the flesh as a man, he limited himself to one place at one time. And that's why it was better for him to go. Because he was said, I will send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to live within my believers, my followers, what we would say Christians. And so because of that, what we understand is, and to be really quite honest, if you don't have the Holy Spirit living within you, then frankly, you're not a Christian. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. When you come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives within you. Romans 8 verse 9 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And so when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, as Christians, when we say, I cannot save myself from my own mess, my own sin, and, and the only thing that can save me is a perfect life, which none of us have lived other than Jesus, so I'm going to trust Jesus and His life and His death and His resurrection as my Savior. The Holy Spirit then comes into our lives. And the Holy Spirit is not just a part of our lives just so that we know that we're Christians. He's actually here to do some things in our lives. One of those things is, is that the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. John 16, 8 says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so the Holy Spirit, as Christians, lives within us, and he doesn't like sin because he's God. There is no sin in God. So when we sin, he's living within us, he gets uncomfortable with that, and then that makes us also uncomfortable. That's what we would call conviction, okay? He wants to make us like Jesus. That's the, one of the works of the Spirit of God living within us. He wants to make us like Jesus in our actual everyday lives. And if we continue to do the same sin over and over and over again, there will be conviction of our sin from the Holy Spirit in our lives. In 1 John chapter 3, it says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And Hebrews 12 tells us, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons, for what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you are not going to be able to keep on sinning over and over and over again in the same sin without God's conviction and his discipline in your life. Now, if there isn't conviction and discipline in your life, then I would say again that you're, you're probably not a Christian or you need to spend some time with Jesus. And here's how you know if, you're, if you have conviction in your life, if you're being convicted by, from something. One, you're going to feel agitated. She's not going to feel comfortable because you cannot enjoy your sin as a follower of Jesus. Sometimes you can't even sleep because of it. And so as a Christian, you just can't enjoy it. The Holy Spirit won't allow you to enjoy sin. There might be a, a time of enjoyment, but after a while, you just, you, you, it, it, it leaves you empty. It leaves you distraught. It leaves you whatever. And so the Holy Spirit will bring circumstances and people into your life to show you your sin. 
And sometimes we try to ignore the, 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 the leading or the speaking of the, of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But, but he, what God wants to do is to bring circumstances and people in your life to, to challenge you in that. God brought people and circumstances into David's life, King David, to convict him of his sin. In fact, he says in Psalm, 30, whoa, Psalm 32, he says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. That's what he felt like when he wasn't dealing with his sin in his life. And that's why, and that's what it's like if you're a Christian and you keep on sinning. You're just miserable. And you, you try to do anything to, to justify or to make yourself feel comfortable or say, like, oh, it was okay for me to do because this happened in my life, or I'm just going through a hard time. We try to justify that to make ourselves feel better and not deal with that sin in our lives. But God will not leave us alone during this. He wants us to be obedient and to repent. And the reason he wants that is, is because sin separates us from him. Sin, it, it brings consequences with it that can mess up our lives. But when we follow God's perfect plan for our lives, it's what's right. It's what's best for us. And we're connected there with God. And there are three things that are going on inside of you when this is happening, when you're sinning, okay? You're going to hear three different voices. You're going to hear guilt, you're going to hear condemnation, and we've, what we've already begun to talk about is and conviction. So guilt, condemnation, and conviction. Now, guilt is from people. People will try to guilt you into doing things for them or with them. And you've probably experienced that more than once in your life or multiple times, right? Where people just try to guilt you, make you feel bad for maybe something you've done, or they try to get you to do something in your life. It's an outside suggestion that makes you just feel really bad. Then we have condemnation, which is from Satan. Satan tries to condemn us, and we see in Romans 8.1 that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who who are in Christ Jesus. So, if you're a follower of Jesus, you don't the condemnation's been gone. But what happens is is sometimes we think that God is talking to us when it's actually not him. It's the enemy, it's Satan. And so how do you know if it's condemnation be, between conviction? How do you know what's which one it is? Well, condemnation will come to us as you were wrong. You will never defeat this thing in your life. You're always going to struggle with it, so you might as well just give up right now because you're a loser. And you're always, your life's just always going to stink because this is who you are. That's condemnation. That's condemnation. It's not from God. It's from Satan. And when we think that it's from God, what happens to us is, is we're afraid to go to God now because we think God's telling us that we're a loser, we're never going to make it, we're never going to be good enough for Him. And we're afraid to go to God. We actually turn away from Him, and it's not the voice of God in our lives. What we've already begun to talk about here is conviction is from God, and God doesn't say you're wrong, but He says this thing is wrong. And he doesn't just leave us there and give up on us, but he says, all right, this was wrong. Turn from it and come to me. Get rid of it and come to me. Help, let me help you get rid of this thing in your life. And so we have to ask ourselves, what voice are we listening to in our lives? Because we've got to be listening to the voice of God. If not, we'll, we'll turn from him. And then we need to turn from our sin and turn toward God. And we say, God, you know, I'm not going to do this thing anymore. I'm not, and I'm just going to turn to you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to run to your strength and not my own because I don't have the strength to do this. And I'm going to get some people around me who are going to help me in my life, people that I can trust, who will pray with me, who will encourage me, who will be accountable partner in this with me in my life. And so if you are being convicted of your sin in your life, it's actually the Holy Spirit working in your life, and this is actually good news. Because again, the Holy Spirit's not doing this to make you be angry with you or to, to, to push you aside and say you're worthless. He's doing it because he wants to make you more like Jesus in your actual life. 
Another thing that the Holy Spirit does is the Holy Spirit illuminates the Bible for us. John 16, 13 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. See, the Holy Spirit confirms in our lives that the Bible is truth. He also helps us to understand what the Bible is actually says and what it means. He shows us what God wants us to know and understand and what he's saying through the Bible. And we want the Holy Spirit to shine His light on the words that we read when we read the Bible so that we have a clear understanding of what it is that we are reading. And have you ever read the Bible and and you're reading something and it just hits you in such a way that you feel like, whoa, that is exactly just what I needed right here at this moment. Like I needed to hear these words and it's powerful for my life right now. Has that ever happened to you? See, that's the way Holy Spirit works sometimes. And now we do still need to study the Bible, okay? And to do that sometimes, really, well, to do that really, we need some good commentaries and some good helps on, on studying what we're reading. And, but we also, when we read the Bible, we need to invite the Holy Spirit in to give us understanding of what the Bible is saying. I don't know if you do that. That'd be a good practice for you. What, would you take time to read the Bible and say, Holy Spirit, will you just show me what this means to me? Another thing that the Holy Spirit does is he shows us who Jesus is. John 16, 14, a lot of these verses are from John 16 as Jesus is talking about the Spirit. And Jesus says in John 16, he says, He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. See, the Holy Spirit will show us Jesus. That's what he wants to do. He wants to reveal Jesus to us. And he'll show us the importance of pursuing Jesus. Because as I've already said here, he wants to make us more like Jesus in our, ever, in our actual everyday lives. Another thing the Holy Spirit does is he marks us as belonging to God. 2 Corinthians is the second letter that Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to this church. He says, And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us in his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So God is saying here that I'm, I'm going to put my Holy Spirit in you to show you that one day in heaven you will resemble me, God says. Not me, but you'll resemble God. And we will delight in God fully at that moment. And we'll delight to follow God fully now because of this, that God has put his seal on us. And that reminds us whose we are. We are children of God. We are sons and daughters of God if, 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 if Christ is our Savior and we're following Him. And so we need to know that we belong to God. That's something that we have to stand in and, and be assured of in our lives, that we belong to God. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. And if we don't hear that voice in our lives of the Holy Spirit telling us that we belong to God and that God loves us, We're going to look for that in other places. We're going to try to find that affirmation somewhere else. And when we don't, we we we, you know when we do that, we're not going to receive the affirmation that we need to hear from God because all those other things, as good as they may be, are ultimately going to leave us empty because they cannot and will not do what God does for us. Romans chapter eight, verse fourteen says. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. See, this is the voice that we need to hear in our lives where we do know for sure that God is our Father How many of you have heard this voice in your life? God says, I am your father, you are my son, or you are my daughter. We need to have this sense in our lives that that I am God's and he is mine. 
Another thing the Holy Spirit does for us is he helps us to overcome sin. And, and, and we talked about the conviction already, but this is a little bit different. This is more than the convicting of sin. But this is the power in our lives to overcome sin. The Holy Spirit is at work in us to work out the sin in our lives. And he's at work in us to lead us to holiness in our lives. So what, you, what we need to do is we actually need to quit fighting sin in our lives. Whatever it is, quit fighting it on your own. Because we're going to struggle with our will when it comes to sin. We also, what we really need to do in all of this is we need to submit our will to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we can overcome sin because we can't do it on our own. And so when we say, Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm surrendering my life, my will to you this today, you this moment, help me, give me the power to, to do what is right, to follow you. That's where our strength comes from. The Holy Spirit empowers us to share the gospel, right? This is what Jesus told his disciples just before he ascended back to heaven. He, he's lived his life. He's died on the cross for our sins and shed his blood on the cross for us. And he uh, rose to life three days after his death on the cross. And he's been talking and he's shown up to his disciples alive. They've touched him. They know he's really alive. It's not just some weird thing. And Jesus is about to go back to heaven. And this is what he says to them. We see it here in Acts chapter 1. He says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come, will co has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so the disciples were supposed to wait for the promise of God the Father. The promise was this filling or this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And God sends this, the, the Holy Spirit to give us power to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And as the disciples were in this upper room on the day of Pentecost, they'd been spending days together. It was disciples and a bunch of other people. They were up in this room and they were praying and they were seeking God and they were waiting for what God, uh, what Jesus had promised them. It says that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues, it says. And really what they were speaking was languages that they had never learned in their life. Most of these guys were uneducated people, right? Fishermen and things like that. And so they didn't know all these other languages. And there was tons and tons of people in the town of Jer city of Jerusalem for this Pentecost festival, many of which had different, knew different languages. And here comes these people out of this room, this building, and they're speaking the glories and the goodness and the gospel of Jesus in their own native languages. And they're like, what's going on? on here these guys obviously aren't are brilliant people but they're speaking this and so peter stands up and he speaks and he shares the message with the boldness of the holy spirit in his life and it tells us in acts chapter 2 that about three thousand became christians that day and this is what the holy spirit wants to do in our lives give us boldness to share the gospel another thing that the holy spirit does is gives us gifts to use for the benefit of other people. And this is where we're going to go over the next couple of weeks here. And this is what we're building toward here. Because this is where 1 Corinthians is leading us. But every follower of Jesus, every Christian has a part to play in the family of God. Every one of us. And what God does is he gives us spiritual gifts to be a part of the body of Christ. So spiritual gifts are, are, are these abilities that the Holy Spirit empowers us to use in the ministry of the church and in the world. So how this works is, is really the Holy Spirit is the gift of God to his people, right? Jesus says, good that I go because I'm sending the helper, the Holy Spirit, and so the gift for us as Christians is the Holy Spirit living within us. But what the Holy Spirit does is works through our lives, empowers us with these giftings so that we can minister to our, each other and to the world and, and, and care for people. And so what we have to do is, is a lot of times we've got to get ourselves out of the way so that the Holy Spirit can work through us. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to do that. And so if you still have 1 Corinthians 12 open, uh, verse 7 tells us, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So to each, to every follower of Jesus, every Christian is given. 
And so spiritual gifts are given for the common good, for the good of the church, for the good of the people around the church people. And so the church has all of the spiritual gifts today. Church does. Every person doesn't have all of the gifts of that we're going to be talking about, but you have at least one, and they're spread out to every follower of Jesus as God sees fit. And so God has given each of us who are followers of Jesus these, these spiritual gifts to use for his glory and for his work. That's what he wants to see. He's it for us to show the world who he is. And when we think about it, this should really get us excited because God has a great purpose for every single one of us who are followers of him. He's got a work for each of us to do. You still have your Bibles open. Verse 11 there, 1 Corinthians 12. It says, and all these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he see or as he wills. So God gives the gifts to us and he knows what he's doing. He's God, right? And so we don't get to choose necessarily what gift that we get. We just need to trust God's judgment in our lives so that whatever he gifts, he gives us, he thinks is best for us, that we just are we're faithful to use it in our lives. We can't be jealous of the other gifts that other people receive. We can only use the gifts that God has given us. And this doesn't mean that we don't try to better our lives because of those kind of things, but we actually need to grow in the areas of our lives and just and, and, and grow in maturity. But we use the gifts that God has given us to do what he has called us to do and be as the church. See, when we were... In Tok, Alaska, we were there for six years as uh, as pastors of a church, and um, for the first year to year and a half, we were working with uh, uh, another pastor, and um, he lived near the Anchorage area, which by vehicle, that's a six-hour drive on good day. And you know, in Alaska, you can have a lot of bad days on the roads, and so it could be a little longer drive. And so what he would do, uh, he would come up about once a month once we got up there. And so this church uh, was a great church, but they, they went through a time of a split and some hard things, and so we were working together to get the church back to where it needed to be and, and to find healing there. And um, this guy, though, when he would come, he would do a Bible study on a Friday night, and then he would, uh, he, would, he would preach that Sunday. And then the rest of the three weeks of the month, I would take care of those things. And, but he, I mean, he was a retired military chaplain. He had some incredible uh, times where he had been some t- things he had been taught and things. And, and so he, just one of his giftings was an incredible teacher. I mean, when you sat through his Bible studies, they were, they were so incredible. You would learn so much from him. And, uh, and, and he would teach in a way like he would not give you the answer. Like he would ask these very, very hard questions about what we were going through in that section of the Bible. And he, and he would lead you along, but he would not give you, and you, you'd struggle to find it until you got to where, where you wanted to be. And, and it was just really powerful. He taught so well. And I saw the way that he taught, and I thought, man, that's just so incredible. So I started in my time when I was leading the Bible study to try to teach like he did. Only problem is, those weren't my giftings. And so it did not go very well. In fact, it didn't go well at all. And so finally, after a little while of this, I, I, I had to realize, like, this is not who I am. This is not how God has gifted me. And so I need to just teach the way that God has gifted me. And I'll tell you what, it got way better. Those Bible studies got way better because I went with the leading and gifting of God and not trying to copy somebody else. So every Christian, as we've been saying, has at least one spiritual gift. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You have a gift, Christian. You have a gift, follower Jesus, and every single gift matters to the church. It does. Every gift has a place, and every gift is valued. You cannot, or you actually, you can, you could if you wanted to neglect your gift and not do anything with it. But I'll tell you what, when you do that, the church suffers. It suffers. We miss out what God wants for us to do 
We don't use our gifts. We don't, and we don't use them for the benefit of the church and benefit for those around us. We miss out. And when you do that, when you're not using your gift, what happens is, is you become bored and you become miserable with church because you're not do, using what God's given you. And so if you're bored with church, it's probably because you're not using your gift. There's really two reasons, the two main reasons people get bored and miserable with church is because one, they're not dealing with the sin and the conviction that the Holy Spirit's talking about in their life, and they're not using their gifts. You become bored and miserable with it. In the church, we can think, well, I don't know if I really have a gift. Like someone could say, well, because I'm not up there where Joel is and doing what he's doing, I really don't have a place in the church. Or I can't sing like our singers up here, and so I don't know if I really have a place in the church. Or I can't play a musician or, or an instrument like the musicians do here up on, at the church. So I don't know if I have a place in this. I don't know if I have a gifting or anything like that. But we don't just need preachers and teachers. We don't just need singers and musicians in the church. When you think about it, we also like we, we definitely need teachers. We need uh, prayer partners. We need people that just have a big heart and that they want to. They just love people and they have big arms that just give people hugs and encourage people. We need all sorts of things within the church. And what happens is, is that when we have a gift, we don't know what to do with it. But we, what we really need to do is, is that you can grow and develop your spiritual gift. Now, when God called me to be a pastor, I was a very shy, introverted kid, and I'm still dealing with some of that introvertedness in my life, but I really couldn't preach to save my life when I first got called into the ministry, and you're like, well, nothing's changed much in 21 years. Well, thank you. Um, no, but it really took time for me to, to grow in, in the giftings that God had given me and what God called me to do in my life. And I'm still growing in that gift today, 21 years since I, I started stepping into to some different ministry things. And hopefully from a couple of years from now, I will still be growing in that. I'll be a better pastor and a better preacher of the Word of God. But when we left our, our second youth pastor at job, this one was a fly-in village in Alaska called Dillingham. Um, the pastor there who became a, a very, very great friend of ours, he and his family, and uh, a real mentor for, for us in our lives in ministry, um, he, he, you know, and I, I haven't seen him face to face since we left Alaska, I don't know, like 18, 19 years ago, I left that part of Alaska to go to the other part. Um, I still think of him as one of the dearest friends in our life and he and his, his family because of, of his mentoring and his friendship. But he told me as we were leaving and he said that when you got here, you couldn't preach yourself out of a bag, a paper bag, even a wet soaking, dripping wet paper bag. You ever touch the paper bag that's soaking? Like you just bump it and it just rips to shreds, right? He said, you couldn't preach yourself out of that. I'm like, wow, thanks. <laughs> that was really nice. But then he says to me, this time here, I've seen you grow and mature in what God has called you to do. And now you're able to preach. I'm like, okay, that's a little better now. We're getting somewhere. But that's what happened. It just took some time to grow in the giftings that God had called in my, had placed in my life. And that's why when someone has a gifting in their lives, we are happy to let you begin to use it and to see God work and grow that in your life. That's why we like to give opportunity to, for people just to grow in their gifts and to see what God has, is doing in their lives. Because the more that you use them, the more that you're going to grow in that gifting that God has given you. And who knows where God will take you if you're faithful just to follow him and use your gift for him. And you may be saying, okay, well, how, how do I discover what my gift is? Like I know you're saying if I'm a Christian, I have a gift. Well, how do I know what it is? Well, we're about to go through these giftings of the Spirit here over the next few weeks. And, and as we go through those, what I want you to do is I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to just show you what He is gifting you with, right? And then you need to step out and use that gift. And so as believers, we're all a part of the body of Christ. 
and we're all needed and we all need to use the gifts and or the gift whether it's gift one or it's gifts plural we need to use those that god has given us for the body of christ so that we can be complete so that we can go out and we can love people and let me just say one more thing less than a minute here and we're just about to wrap this up and there may be times when when god will use one of these gifts in your life where it's, it's needed, even though it may not necessarily be your real spiritual gift that you use on a regular basis. Like, you know, I, 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 I really feel like God's called me and gifted me with the, the preaching and teaching, and even though I'm still growing in that and I can become better in that, uh, I really believe that's one of the, the, the gifts that God has given me. But there are times when God may give me another, like the Spirit of God may use me in another way in a gifting that I don't really feel is mine all the time. Like sometimes when I'm praying for somebody, one of the giftings of the Spirit is is a word of wisdom. And I feel like God gives me a word of wisdom, or the Holy Spirit gives me a word of wisdom for that person as I'm praying for them. And it's right what they needed to hear, and I have no idea what's going on sometimes. And the Holy Spirit does. He knows what's going on in that person's life, and he gives that word of wisdom to help bring healing in their life. And so God may do that through you. And so you have to be ready and willing. That's why I'm saying that when we have the gifts, of the, when we want the, the, the Spirit to use those gifts in us, we have to sometimes get ourselves out of the way and allow the Holy Spirit to work through us. And so this is what the Holy Spirit does in us. Very quickly, we went through it this morning. You can go in way more detail into all of these things, of course. We hit on a lot of different things. But let me just tell you this morning, God loves you. God has a place for you. He values you. And he wants to work through you if you would just submit yourself to him. Say, God, I can't, I can't save myself. I need you. And I want to be more like you in my life every day. And so then the Holy Spirit will come. And there's a lot more to it, obviously, but that was, that's, that's really the elementary thing of it. The Holy Spirit comes and He wants to work in our lives. So would you bow your heads this morning? <clears throat> if you're a follower of Jesus and, and, and you don't know what your spiritual gift is, I'm going to ask you to just pray a prayer. It's a simple prayer. And say, Holy Spirit, as we go through these teachings and, and, and as we look at the, the gifts of the Spirit, will you just show me what, how you want to use me? How you want to work in my life and through my life to, to encourage and to strengthen and to love other people? How do you want it to, to have me be a part of what's happening at Chico First and in the local churches? If you're a follower of Jesus or a Christian who, who already knows what those giftings may be, would you just take a moment and pray, Holy Spirit, will you show me how I can be using those gifts here in the church and to those around me, my neighbors, my friends, my co-workers, my family. Maybe you know what those gifts are and you're not using them. You're not growing in them. Today's the day that you just say, Holy Spirit, I surrender to you. How you want to work in my life and use me. If you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're not a Christian and you don't sense the Holy Spirit in your life and, and, and you're not sure, today you can do that. All you need to pray is, God, I realize that Jesus did for me what I could not do for myself, that he lived a perfect life. He never sinned. And then he went to the cross for me to pay for my sin. He shed his blood and he died for my sins on the cross. He took them all upon him. And then three days later, he rose again to life. Victory over death and sin and Satan. And so I trust in Jesus to be my Savior. Not me, not anything else. And I want to follow Jesus with the rest of my life. 
I want to be a part of the family of God. I want to know you, God. And you can pray that prayer. And allow God to work in your life. Allow Him to seal that with the Holy Spirit in your life. So we've prayed those prayers this morning, or you've, you've, you, these are the prayers I want you to pray this morning. And as the music's just playing right now, would you just take a moment to just pray those prayers? You can come up here to the front and pray. You can pray at your seat. But just take this moment, and we'll wrap this up in prayer in just a minute.